Okay, now we're going to talk about materiality. And, and here we have this little cartoon here where they're saying, we conducted our audits in accordance, accordance with auditing standards generally accepted in the United States of America. Those standards require that we plan and perform the audit to obtain reasonable assurance about whether the financial statements are free of material misstatements. Well, what does this mean exactly? We're going to just go through that statement and analyze what these components of what exactly is material misstatement and what is obtain reasonable assurance. What, is, what does that mean also? Yeah, you'll find out, yes. That's a way to look at it. Um, material, what exactly is materiality? Is the application of accounting standards and accounting policies involves a high degree of judgment. Where decisions are required about the appropriateness of a particular accounting judgment, the concept of materiality suggests that this should only be an issue if the judgment is significant or material to a user of the accounts. So the question is, who are the user of the accounts? Um, and how, what degree is it going to affect the financial statements and what the, the company is, is uh, stated on their financial statements. Mater materiality is one of the basic and major concepts of auditing. This is, this is sort of like professional judgment. They sort of go hand in hand. Yet the materiality concept remain, remains an ambiguous concept because it's subject to professional judgment. A myriad of research has shown that auditors do not reach a consensus as to the meaning of material. Because it's basically, this is your intuition, your judgment as an auditor and the, and the uh, client relationship that makes you come up with the idea of what's you know, the level of materiality. So it's subject to revision. It can be revised um, based on the change in circumstances of the client, the economy, the industry. So we see like the toy company, it may not have been that, you know, the, whatever we saw there may not have even been occurring like five years ago. So, you know, the audit's always changing. The current firm's always changing, the dynamic. So once you make a decision five years ago, it doesn't mean that you can hold on to the same decision or the same uh, judge, uh, judgment of materiality level five years later. So it's an assessment made by an auditor of the amount of the tolerable misstatement. There's always going to be some level of misstatement in the financial statements. So the question is, uh, what level is acceptable? of a client's of financial statements in relationship to the amount of assessed risk assumed. So that's based on, you know, the risk level that you've, based on looking at the tone at the top, the accounting practices, and the internal controls, all these issues, you're going to decide the amount of assessed risk assumed in the client and the perceived users of the report. So that usually is the stakeholders, there are creditors, um, there could be another company perhaps that wants to buy them out. You know, there's like a number of myriad of stakeholders and interested users of the information. And it's considered throughout all three stages of an audit and considered in the planning, your field work, and the final analytical procedures, which I think you guys reviewed last week. If you had class last week, I'm not sure, but with the weather. <laughs> a materiality assessment determines the extent of audit procedures performed by the CPA. This is part of your audit plan. And the financial statements that have been determined to be material misstated by a CPA must either be adjusted or the CPA must issue a qualified or adverse opinion, which um, most firms want to avoid that. So usually th this is where it stops before they have to issue a qualified or adverse opinion. <coughs> when is it material? Good question. <laughs> Information is material if its omission or misstatement could influence the economic decision. So it's got to be significant. So a $3,000 misstatement for Walmart is not significant. A user is taken on the basis of financial statements. Materiality depends on the size of the item or error judged in the particular circumstances of its omission or misstatement. Thus, materiality provides a threshold or cutoff point rather than being a primary qualitative characteristic which information must have if it is to be useful. So, you know, this is it basically has to affect the economic decisions of users of, of the information. Now, this is on the public or the external auditing side. Um, internal auditors may have a whole different metric that they operate. You know, for example, I'm working on a project now where the internal auditors have decided that a cup of coffee in terms of fraud is material. So that's a different aspect of materiality. But in terms of external auditors, they're not going to look for the fraud. You know, they may report small frauds to the audit committee and say you may want to look at this area of the company in terms of their internal controls, but that's not significant or relevant for most financial statements with a cup of coffee that's 95 cents. So, so there's, you know, there's always an issue of cost versus materiality level. What level can you assure the financial statements and make them, and, 
and to verify the economic decisions for the, the user of the financial statements and also keep the cost down at a reasonable level. So it's, the, it's a very complex judgment of, of, of assessing materiality. What will versus will not affect the decision of a knowledgeable third party given a specific set of circumstances? It's not an absolute or black and white issue. It's the determination of materiality requires professional judgment. And what do you guys think professional judgment is? In your judgment? <laughs> I mean, did you guys cover professional judgment already? or? Yes, it's similar, yes. It's basically your analysis, you know, based on your observations and your no knowledge of the, the firm and industry, uh, you know, of your decision of, of what, uh, based on your observations. And what you know about accounting and auditing and what you're expecting, you know, sometimes you have to, use, you know, professional judgments based also on what is standard for the industry, for example. So you have to know the industry, you have to know accounting, you have to know the auditing practice, you have to know your client. You know, this is all goes into professional judgment. And materiality is critical for the audit success and the process. It's not a simple calculation. It's, the whole, it's the, whole, the whole mesh of everything that goes into auditing, into your, audit, um, your auditing engagement goes into the, the matter of materiality assessment. And accounting and auditing standards do not provide specific materiality guidelines for practitioners. It's, a very, flexible, it's very flexible in that area. And the preliminary judgment is the maximum amount by which the auditor believes the statements could be misstated and still not affect the decisions of reasonable users. And the materiality judgments affect both the amount of the work done by the auditor and the disclosures made or not made in the financial statements. And the auditor's responsibility is to determine whether financial statements are materially misstated. So you're going to verify the preliminary judgment. If there is a material misstatement, the auditor will bring it to the client's attention so the correction can be made so that they don't get a qualified or adverse report in the, in the opinion. So there's a quantitative base for materiality factors and usually it's three to five percent. So a company that's got really great internal controls probably has a base of five percent whereas somebody firm that may have like less restrictive internal controls or ones that are questionable would probably go with a three percent. So you're looking at total revenues, it's based on total revenues, gross profit, income before taxes, income from continuing operations, total assets, and your three-year average income. But you can't rely strictly on those numbers to come up with materiality. You have to look at also whether they're close to violating loan covenants, um, if they have any kind of misstatements that, uh, that change the loss to a net income, for example, or they're doing income smoothing. Uh, do they have break-even earnings, which looks like they may, might have massaged some numbers one way or the other to make it happen. Um, is there a lot of management turnover? Is there a lot of pressure within the company to get their quarterly earnings? Are there high market pressures? Like that toy company had really high market pressures and a lot of pressure from their customers. Um, are there high fraud risks within the company? You know, there are like a high cash situation, a lot of cash involved, or other areas of, of high fraud risk? And do they have a normal or higher than normal risk of bankruptcy? These are all things you have to look at in terms of whether to put a three to five percent threshold on materiality. These are more the qualitative, this is like your professional judgment, your assessment, your, your observation. You know, as an auditor you have to not just see, you have to observe, which is actually like trying to understand what, what something is showing as opposed to just looking at it at the surface. So auditors set materiality thresholds early in the engagement, in the beginning, and these thresholds represent the maximum statements that could be misstated and still not affect user's decisions. And this is, done, this is performed during the planning stage of the audit. And then you make a determination based on individual misstatements as well as the aggregate misstatements. So, you know, some areas of the business may have may higher thresholds than others, but an aggregate amount has to be uh, maintained and agreed, agreed upon. And the tolerable misstatement would be the amount of misstatement the auditor is willing to consider and conclude that the account is fairly stated. So, that's basically, you're trying to decide at this point, like, what is tolerable for the account. The evidence is accumulated by segments rather than for the whole financial statements as a whole. So you're going down through every portion of the business cycle for I mean, assessing it. And most practitioners allocate materiality to balance sheet accounts initially. When materiality may be allocated to balance sheet accounts, the auditor must be mindful of the impact on the income statement and also the cash flow since most balance sheet accounts adjustments will also impact the income statement. 
In addition, the investment community is often more sensitive to companies' earnings than the balance sheet. And as most investors actually will look at cash flows first, then they look at the income statement. So we have to look at all these effects of the balance sheet and, and the materiality assessments on these two other statements. And the two, the two greatest types of misstatements are the known auditor can determine the amount of the misstatements, and likely misstatements would be differences in auditor judgments versus client judgment, judgments about his estimates, and projections based on auditor's test of a sample from a population. And if the estimated misstatements exceed the preliminary judgment, then the financial statements are not acceptable. So if, they, if your, your, your findings exceed the preliminary assessment, then they, they're not acceptable. So you have to perform additional procedures that require a client to make adjustments to their financials. So that's the end of the materiality section. Then we'll talk, talk about the assessing and responding to risk, which is, also has a lot to do with our project that we discussed earlier today. So basically, auditors must grace, grasp the real nature of risks that their clients present and deal with them effectively. And the risk assessment standards are geared towards more effective audits as a result of the better risk assessments and auditing standards number 12, and improved design and performance of audit procedures to respond to the risks in the, in the standards number 13. So you really must understand your client and understand the industry and the business, and understand where they stand in the business and industry at the time of the audit. And that, like I said, could change every time, every year. Like another really big example of that, like in the last five years, was MF Global, which I don't know if you guys know, but it's, it's, you know, that John Corzon ran for a while and it ran into problems because he, came, he came from a very aggressive hedge fund, you know, uh, foreign investments background before he went, became governor. And MF Global, this sleepy little, they were a commodities trading group. They were, they were very conservative, very small. This, you know, they were under the radar all these years. And he took over and the whole dynamic of the company changed. And the auditors never changed their, their materiality thresholds or their risk assessment of the client. And sure enough, within two years, they went bankrupt. You know, they ran out of money, and, and you know, the uh, investors lost a lot of money. And it was a big scandal. In fact, it's still being settled in court. So, I mean, the auditors were also questions of why they didn't see certain questionable transactions, because they, their, the threshold was still too high. They, were still, they still had been running the audit as if it was a small, sleepy bond brokerage firm instead of this high-risk investment company that became. So you have to look at, as an auditor, if you have a financial company you're dealing with, that particular, you have to check and see how they're trading and what their, their, uh, their uh, trading profile is like in the industry. So auditors must perform risk assessment procedures continually that are sufficient to provide a reasonable basis for the identification and assessment of the risks of material misstatement, whether due to error or fraud, and design further audit procedures uh, based on what you discover. And risk assessment procedures need to encompass both external and company to specific factors. An inappropriate identification or assessment of risks of material misstatements can lead to overlooking relevant risks to the financial statements, leading to misdirected or inadequate audit work. So basically, you have to make, you not only identify the appropriate level and where these risks to occur, but you also have to make sure you don't miss anything. So it's, you know, it's a question of having too many false positives and false negatives. You want to avoid the false negatives. I mean, so remember, the materiality, the one we, part we just discussed, is related to risk and is related to your assessment of the risk. Audit risk is defined in terms of material misstatement. So the audit risk level is defined by the level of material misstatement. The higher the audit risk, the lower the materiality level assessed by the auditor. And auditors must have, you have to accept some level of risk. No, no firm is without risk, but the question is what level is acceptable. And risk exists, so the question is, well, what do you, well, how do you address these uh, risks and how is the company addressing these risks and what can you suggest to the firm to address these risks? And proper risk response is part of addressing and achieving a high quality audit. So the firm may not, it may not be 100% successful, but if they're showing that they're making a great effort and they're actually, it's just a matter of time before the risks become in total, uh, totally uh, successful, then, then perhaps then the, they would get a better quality audit. An audit risk is evaluated in terms of audit risk model, which is, is also called ARM. And basically, audit risk is the risk or likelihood that the auditor may unknowingly fail to modify the opinion on financial statements that are materially misstated. In other words, an unqualified opinion on misstated financial statements. So you don't want to be in that situation, the auditor, we give the stamp of approval, they're A-OK, -okay, and they have lots of problems. And that's happened, I mean, 
What happens is they get slapped, the, current, the company may get sued, and what happens is the SEC usually settles out of court and it's a big fine. But you, there, you can go to websites and, this, and the SEC has a, a listing of the firms that are, have been slapped on the hand and what their, their fines are, and all the big four are on there. So I mean, some, some years are bigger than others. And so how willing is the auditor to accept the financial statements that may be materially misstated after the audit has been completed and the report issued? The audit risk model basically breaks down overall audit risk into three components. You have inherent risk, which is IR. You have control risk, which is CR. And detection which risk, which is DR. And AR equals IR times CR times IR. And they have the inherent risk and control risk, which we equal the risk of material misstatement. So like we said, the two big items for um, assessing the control, the material misstatement is the inherent risk, and the, and the nature of the company and how they operate, and the control risk, what are their internal controls to handle the risk that are identified. And there's a direct relationship, to, relationship between audit risk and detection risk, inversely related to evidence. So the lower the AR, the lower the DR, the greater the evidence is required, or the more evidence is required, and more sampling is required to do the audit, to complete the audit. So, the, there's also some limitations in the model, like you can't always achieve that actual level of de desired audit risk. And the audit risk is actually, like we said, well, it could be, let's say, you decide based on a preliminary analysis of the company and you want it to be 3%. So that AR is assigned to a, a number of 3%. Then the other, th other two numbers have to be filled in. I mean, that's where you come in and you, and you, you give levels for the control risk and the detection risk, what's acceptable. But it has to meet that AR number. It does not consider potential auditor error, which is, a big one. I mean, auditors are human beings, and even as day of like, internet technology and information systems, there's still room for error because at some point machines can't make decisions all the time. It has to, it's up to your professional judgment, and there's no way of knowing really what the preliminary level of audit risk really was. So all these are issues. Inherent risk is basically the assessment of the likelihood that there are material misstatements before considering internal controls. It's based on your dis discussion or interviews. Uh, of management, your observations of the company, uh, how they, how certain procedures are handled, your knowledge of the company, your prior audits, um, you know, discussion perhaps within the industry with other other players in the industry. It's inversely related to detection risk and directly related to evidence. So the higher the IR, inherent risk, which means you have to put greater risk and then lower the detection risk. Going back to that balanced equation here, where you have the AR. See, what, the AR is 3%, let's say, so the AR, IR, CR, and DR are all fluctuating based on the AR assessment. And factors of flu, affecting account inherent risk include the dollar size of the account. So the higher the dollar amount, the more chances there are of risk. Liquidity, the more liquid the account, the greater the risk. The volume of transactions, the greater number of transactions, the more greater chance there is of, of a risky situation. Complexity of the transactions. Um, if there's new accounting pronouncements affecting it, so for example, in the case of leasing, for example, airlines right now should be under scrutiny because the lease accounting rules are changing and how, they, uh, how they're stated in the financial statements. So this is a big area of risk right now for all the airline companies and let's say trucking companies, anybody that leases uh, most of their equipment. And it's also uh, subjective estimates are also a big part of this. So these are all areas you have to look at for, inherent, for assessing inherent risk. Control risk is whether assessment of whether misstatements will be prevented or detected by the client's internal controls. So are they really doing a good job of trying to maintain uh, the level of fraud down? Or are they trying to keep and detect uh, material misstatements within the financial processes? And there's a really close relationship between the control and inherent risks, and that's called the risk of material misstatement. And effective internal controls obviously reduce the likelihood of misstatements. So, you know, if, if you have a system in your, in your uh, information systems where all the transactions are recorded in like a black box or like a separate file and that they can't be altered, that's going to change how people are trying to, how they're entering transactions and what they're doing online with accounts. Perhaps they, they think twice about fraud or trying to change the misstatement or trying to change the numbers. And, and the risk between control risk and detection risk is inverse. So the relationship between control risk and substantive evidence is direct. So the higher the control risk, the lower the detection risk, and the greater the evidence is required. And so the factors that affect the control risk are the environment of the company, its control environment or tone at the top, 
the existence or lack thereof and effectiveness of control activities and monitoring activities, like how effective is the audit committee? Are they really outsiders? Are there, is there a financial expert on the audit committee? Um, how effective is the internal auditors? I mean, are they basically objective? Are they keep themselves, are they, they keep themselves separate from the rest of the company? Although internal auditors always have this classic problem, like where since their paychecks are paid by the company, you know, the question is how, how uh, independent are they truly, but that's a whole different argument there. But um, basically, so you have to assess all the monitoring activities that are in place by the company. What, do they have like a hotline for company, for employees to call if they see something questionable? I mean, those are big, these are all areas you have to look at as an auditor. And that also assess, uh, gives you an idea of like how much you rely on their statements based on this control risk. Detection risk is a risk that a material misstatement would not be caught by audit procedures. So that determines the amount of substantive testing that you're going to conduct. It's an inverse relationship, so it's opposite. So the lower the DR, the more evidence you have to collect. So you might think, well, the lower the DR, the, like the lower the evidence, but it's actually the opposite. So try to think of that, you know, memorize that inverse relationship. And so factors affecting detection risk include the nature and the timing and extent of audit procedures. So for example, like, you know, like with our situation with the toy company, the way the, all the revenue is coming towards, and all the production is happening towards the end, that could affect, it'd be hard to find, uh, mis, you know, misstatements during that period of time. Um, there's also sampling risk. You may choose an unrepresentative sample. You may choose too small a sample, or by, by luck of the draw, or lack of luck of the draw, pull the wrong sampling to look at. Although nowadays with continuous auditing and monitoring systems in some companies, it's a real-time continual auditing situation where there's no sampling involved at all. But that's, you probably learned that in AIS class, right? Did you have AIS already, most of you? Yeah, so you learned about continual auditing and continual monitoring? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and there's also the risk that you may come to the appropriate or the, the lack of correct conclusions about the available evidence. So that's your human error or that's a professional judgment question there. So here's a nice little chart for you to look at. So you can see here, the lower the detection risk, you have to do more effective testing. Like I said, this is an inverse relationship. Testing is done more at the year end and you have to do more testing. So if you have a higher detection risk, then it's the opposite. It's like you can do less testing, smaller samples. Testing can be performed in the interim during the year, and then you can do fewer tests. So the idea would be to have the higher detection risk where you don't have to do so much testing. It's better for the client and it's less work for you. And this is another way to look at the statement here. Like I said, you're, you're setting the AR initially low or very low. It could be three to five percent. It's usually standard for the industry. Then you're going to assess the risk of material misstatement, you're going to assess the IR, and that would be high if material misstatement is likely to enter the accounting information system. This chart may be in your book, by the way. I think it, I'm not sure which book you guys use, but I think this is in the, your book. Um, and the control risk is high if material misstatement is not likely to be detected by clients' internal controls. So you assess those two, and then you calculate the DR, the remaining variable, okay? And what is the acceptable level of detection risk? High means we can afford less effective testing, though means we can need more effective testing. And again, here is another chart, a nice little flow chart. By the way, as an, on, when you're doing auditing, you're going to be doing, making a lot of little flow charts of the company's processes and their procedures. So as part of understanding the firm, you have to see how the, the processes flow through different workstations and different individuals. So get used to seeing flow charts. You'll be making them a lot. And basically, you're documenting everything along the whole process, the risk assessment process. You document, 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 and auditing. It's just like law and, you know, in legal profession, everything is documented. The same goes with the auditing. So you're like, even in your, you're understanding the company's environment. You're looking at the industry and external factors. You're looking at the accounting principles and disclosures. Which, which, what are, which ones are affected, affecting this firm? The nature of the company. What kind of environment do they have? What is, are they a mining company, an airline company? Uh, a financial industry, an insurance company, all these have different variables, different environments. Uh, what's the objectives and strategies of the company? You know, do they say one thing, like customer service is number one, but then they're all about revenues and goals and numbers achievement internally. So you have to look at a, whatever dichotomy may be between a public and what's actually happening internally. But you have to understand the internal control or financial reporting, as, as discussed also um, we discussed that a little earlier about what kind of internal controls they have within the company. 
And then you're going to get information from client acceptance and, re and retention evaluation, audit planning and pass audits and other engagements. These are all co going to collection of your assessment. You're going to perform your analytical procedures and verify your numbers. You're going to do, conduct lots of brainstorming. You're going to sit down as a team and look at your flow charts and see where you think would be areas of weakness in the, in the analysis. And you may make inquiries with the audit committee about other issues in the past. Um, they should, they're, they're supposed to be objectives, so they should share that information with you, and also with management and others who cooperate. Then you're going to assess the risk factors. And they're going to respond. The companies will respond to the risk factors you identify. And they're going to, their company's going to either do more effective with substantive procedures or conduct procedures closer to year-end uh, specialists and experienced professional who may be involved at this point to assess, and with assessment. And they'll communicate to the auditing committee and to the firm. Any questions about the process of risk assessment? Okay. So basically the whole pro what's what exactly is going on with the preliminary analytical procedures? They're, they're basically looking at the recorded account balance and versus the estimated account balance. And the estimated account balance is what you determine should be the account balance based on your risk assessment of the situation. It's identifying potential problem areas. It's basically a starting place to start examining the financial statements to see where it could be areas of concern. And you're basically also looking for changing relationships in the data uh, from one period to another or from one year to another. And you want to ask yourself the question, what could be wrong or what could go wrong? And what kind of reasons are legitimate for this to occur? So if, you know, if you can't satisfactorily answer those questions, that's a higher risk area in the financial statements. And also you're going to be doing cash flow analysis. A cash flow is a king for most companies. That's what keeps them ticking. So if there's cash flow issues, that's automatically a red flag. So you develop an expectation based on your preliminary calculations. You define a significant difference, which you're willing to accept as a variation from your ex expectations. You calculate the predictions and compare them with recorded amount that the client claims on the financial statements. And you investigate significant differences or what you think is um, not significantly or, or, or explained uh, adequately. You document, document, document each of these above steps. You know, everything in auditing, like I said, is documented. Not on paper. Usually you can do Word documents now, but you always want to cover yourself. So in terms of analytical procedures I and mean, an audit for public firms, it's required. Preliminary planning is required. And final review is required. And the uh, substantive testing is optional. So what kind of risk of material misstatements due to errors or frauds can we look at? And the examples of misstatements include inaccuracy or gathering and processing data from which financial statements are prepared. Um, a difference between the amount of reported financial statement account and the amount which would be reported under GAAP, for example. The mission of a financial statement element account or an item. I mean, if they conveniently forgot something, um, that'd be questionable. An incorrect accounting estimate arising from oversight or misinterpretation of facts, which can be corrected. These all can be corrected, but you have to look at the misstatement and identify why it occurred and the mission of information required to be disclosed in accordance with GAAP. So, for example, the lease accounting issue, that would be another, you would have to look at the area of, their, of how they're declaring the leases very carefully and make sure they're in accordance with the new rules. An auditor must design and implement audit response to address the risk of material misstatement that are identified and assessed according to his, um, auditing standard number 13. An auditing appropriate assignments of significant engagement responsibilities um, do professional care and performance of work. It provides the extent of supervision that is appropriate for the circumstances in the audit. And incorporate elements of unpredictability in the selection of audit procedures to be performed from year to year. So like I said, you have to see what's going on with the company from year to year. Just because it was one type of audit the year before doesn't mean that the same one will apply again this year. You have to do this procedure every year because not, nothing is the same in business. It's always dynamic. It's always changing. And that it may even change during the audit which you'll observe also. You have to evaluate the company's selection and application of significant accounting principles, like whether they're really following up to date with the rules and the regulations. An auditor should determine whether it's necessary to make pervasive changes to the nature, timing, or extent of the audit to adequately address addressed, assessed risks of material misstatements. So again, going back to the reassessment, you're reassessing every year, even your regular client you've had for 20 years, you can't walk in and assume that they're going to get the same risk assessment year after year after year because businesses do change. And you have to exercise professional skepticism. 
and you have to modify your planned audit procedure to obtain more reliable evidence sometimes, or you have to obtain sufficient appropriate evidence to corroborate management's explanations or representations. So it goes back to being skeptical and exercising professional judgment and being independent. No matter if you've been there, they've been your client for 20 years, you have, you, things, companies change and business change and, and industries change, and this all has to be in your mind as you walk into a new audit assignment every year. And you must design and perform audit procedures in a manner that addresses the assessed risk of material misstatement for each relevant assertion of, of each significant account and disclosure. It's a pretty thorough process. All the, all the assertions have to be tested for every account, basically, that matters to the company and, disclosed, and is disclosed. And you have to obtain more persuasive audit evidence to hire the auditor's assessment of risk. So you have to collect more evidence. And you have to take into account the types of potential misstatements that could result from identified risks and the likelihood and magnitude of potential misstatement. And then you have to design the testing controls to accomplish objectives of both financial statement and also testing the internal controls, audits simultaneously. So you're testing for both these issues at the same time. You're verifying the financial statements and you know, within a certain level of material misstatement. And you also have to verify the internal controls. They're very similar in audit procedures, but and the one, the internal controls is part of the material risk assessment, but they have to be conducted simultaneously. And so the big engagement risk you face as an auditor is that you don't, you misreport. You, you give them a, a, an unqualified opinion when they've actually misstated a lot. And you can face client and third party lawsuits. Um, you could, you know, there could be a failure of audit. You could get your, get a bad reputation. You get negative publicity. Um, but nowadays, like I said, a lot of times the firms just pay the SEC a nice little fine and it's reported, you know, website that most people don't even know to look at. And, you know, there's not, there's not very rarely there's a lot of publicity. Like MF Global was a rare situation, mainly because it was Corazine and it was a big fund that went, you know, went down. And it was really obvious oversight in the terms of part of the auditors, the PwC actually. Um, but anyway, so, and actually that was another case where the audit partner there was the same audit partner in many of the financial firms. So engagement risk is closely related to client business risk. It's a very similar way to look at it. And you have to decide whether engagement risk and using that risk to modify the acceptable audit risk. And the acceptable audit risk is the degree to which external users rely on the financial statements, the likelihood that the client will have financial difficulties after the audit report is issued, and the auditor's evaluation of management's integrity. So these are all part of your assessment of the audit risk level. And that is the end.